in Australia and getting in press. That will be out uh, later in the year. One of the things that we're going to argue here is that the fear of death is really at the centre of so much psychopathology. One of the problems, I think, in mental health is that uh, if you uh, if you look at the research in mental health across these disorders, panic disorder, illness, anxiety disorder, and so on, unfortunately, the research is being conducted by different people. We live in these research silos. If you get the world's leading experts on panic, they're a different group to the world's leading experts on OCD, who are a different group, again, to the world's leading experts on separation anxiety. And they, they are off on their own, in their silos, and then they're working on elaborate cognitive models of the particular uh, disorder. And so they'll, they'll publish cognitive models with um, uh, differences, subtle differences across the conditions uh, to try and explain the symptomatology of that precise condition. But that might be missing a big picture. And I, I'm going to argue that it has been missing a big picture. That working in this way uh, it stops you from seeing the commonalities across mental health. What we need to do is sort of draw back and look across these conditions and see is there a common feature? Is there something that seems to run through this? And I'll argue strongly that it is fear of death. One way for you to see that is to simply look at the cognition. Look at the thoughts that people in these various conditions have. What do they talk about? What's the phenomenology from a cognitive point of view? Panic patients routinely tell us that they're having a heart attack, or very commonly, that there's something fundamentally physically wrong with me. Now that, that I hear a lot in panic. There's something fundamentally physically wrong with me, and, and it just hasn't been found. OCD patients, of course, uh, might fear contamination, uh, disease-related contamination. They might worry that they'll burn the house down and kill everyone. They might worry that their thoughts can kill. In aggressive obsessions, people will say, I'm, I'm having images of harm coming to people, and I'm worried that the images might themselves uh, produce uh, the, these, uh, the, these deaths. In GAD, in, in generalised anxiety, in worriers, uh, not all of the themes, of course, and, and I should say at this point, we're certainly not trying to say here today that everything is dread of death. All, all disorders can be explained by dread of death in their entirety, or that all presentations relate to dread of death. We're saying that dread of death is a common feature running through psychopathology. So in GAD, they worry about many things, of course, uh, but, but one of the sets of worries is about harm coming to them, harm coming to them. Um, and I have many GADs. I've mentioned the one there about terrorism in the Opera House in Sydney. Of course, the Opera House is quite an iconic structure, and I have many GADs that say, I wouldn't go anywhere near that, that building, I wouldn't go anywhere near this area of the city. That's where I think harm will happen to us. PTSD, the person might respond by uh, threat thoughts around the queues. I can't go out at night now, I know I'll get attacked. Illness anxiety is an obvious one. I've got illnesses that are serious. People with illness anxiety disorder aren't generally worried about getting a gastrointestinal bug, are they? They generally aren't coming forward going, I think I've got uh, diarrhea, I think I've, I think I've picked up a gastric bug. They're worried about serious illnesses. They're often worried about things that are gonna be difficult to detect, that are gonna kill them in the future. Um, somatic symptom disorder is similar. In separation anxiety disorder, why? What, what is the fear related to of separation? Yes, they fear separation, but why? When you ask them, this is at least in terms of the cognition that these people report, when you ask them what, what, what would be so bad if you, know, you get separated uh, from, from mum, uh, separated from some, well, something bad is gonna happen to me, or something bad is gonna happen to mum. And in children with separation anxiety disorder, there are often death-related themes in their dreams. So I was separated and then a car hit me or a car hit mum. Uh, you know, quite, quite vivid dreams where separation is associated with uh, their demise. 
the specific phobias. My original work, my first work, was in the specific phobias and fears of water and fears of heights. And look, it's pretty obvious when you go through the specific phobias. In fact, it was first noted in the 1960s that the specific phobias seem to all be reducible to death threat. You know, heights, water, enclosed spaces, snakes, spiders, they, they, these are things that can kill. Um, so again, this might be playing a role. Now some of the other disorders, I could list many, many other disorders. Some of them, it's a longer bow to get to death. Like I've mentioned body dysmorphia there, where somebody's saying, I've got to fix this, I've got to take this error away, I've got to keep looking pristine. You might think it's a, it's a longer bow. Rachel is doing research at the moment to see the relationship between, the, the precise size of the relationship between death scale scores and people with body dysmorphia, um, but I believe there is a relationship, we just don't know the size of it. And in depression, again, so often if you keep drilling down on what people are saying, so often they'll get to a pointlessness or a meaninglessness uh, of their existence. There's no point to anything I do. Uh, I get up, I work, I come home, I eat, sleep, and then I just do it all again. Um, the aunts and uncles of my childhood are in nursing homes now. Uh, someone, someone said to me not, not too long ago, one day I'll be dead so long, no one will know I, I ever lived. The aunts and uncles one is an interesting one. I had, a, I had an experience myself where uh, one of my nieces, um, this was a year or, no, well actually, the years fly, don't they? I think it was perhaps several years ago, <laughs> two or three or four, and one of my nieces was talking to me and uh, I was being a bit silly and she said, you're my crazy uncle, Uncle Ross, you're my crazy uncle and she ran off and I was quite taken aback by my emotional reaction because when I was a boy I had an uncle that I called my crazy uncle and he's dead now and I was quite taken aback by my reaction of how did I become crazy uncle, I was the boy, you know, there was this clear existential-like moment where I didn't quite understand how that role had been, had been taken by me. Some people writing this area, we've certainly made this point, is that the point that evolution is involved here because evolution favoured problem-solving capacities and humans are tremendous problem-solvers. Evolution has equipped us with tremendous problem-solving capacities. But what is problem-solving? Well, it's the ability to move forward. It's the ability to move forward in time and, and see that the lions could be around the corner, so I'm gonna duck down this way and head to the lake. It's the ability to see what's coming. And you know, I've referred to that in some places, and uh, Rachel and I in, in Clinical Psych Review, I think we use the phrase, the curse of the reflective consciousness comes at a price, this tremendous capacity to look forward uh, because we know where we're going, going forward, we're going to the grave. Death is a ubiquitous theme in art, film, literature and philosophy. Every major artist, every major artist has explored death. It's interesting that there's a wonderful volume, A Thousand and One Paintings to See Before You Die, uh, clearly the author was having an existential crisis uh, himself. You know, he's, he's writing about what you've got to do before you die. I did a count, and uh, I get, d depending on how you classify them, up to about 70% of these 1,001 greatest pieces of art have a clear death theme, a clear death theme. Um, filmmakers, there's Ingmar, uh, how many people have seen Bergman's The Seventh Seal? Yeah, fascinating, wonderful film about uh, a chap who's confronted by the Grim Reaper, who says uh, he's come for him, and the, the chap is not ready to go. This knight that's returned from uh, uh, fighting is not ready to go, and he says to the Grim Reaper, I hear you're a bit of a chess player, uh, why don't we play? And while the game's going, um, uh, I don't die. And it, and it follows his meanderings as he comes to terms with this. Uh, Woody Allen and others, and ch children's films. And when we talk about treatment in the art, 
in the second half of today, I'll talk about the fact that we use films like Up, uh, which explore death and loss and how to live, uh, are films that we use in treating the dread of death. I think in clinical psychology in, in general, we're underusing these sorts of materials that others have produced. Filmmakers can send messages much better than I can. I've just got me in a clinic room and some paper and some pens. I don't have an orchestra behind me. The lights don't dim when I'm making an important point and, and my chair doesn't move closer or further away. I don't have the dramatic effects that a filmmaker has. They make their points about existential issues really well. And we know that therapy, when it's salient, is better therapy. Therapy that actually really uh, has an impact on people. I'll we'll, we'll talk more about that in the afternoon. And again, the writers, it's death is the ubiquitous film in literature. Uh, I did a count on Hemingway's short stories, and again, you get up to around 70% of the, of the masterworks of Hemingway. If you look at all of the short stories, have a clear death theme. Uh, in Shakespeare, the man I've always regarded as the greatest psychologist I've ever come across, Shakespeare seems to really understand humans and the human condition. Half of the Shakespearean plays have clear reference, clear reference to grappling with death uh, dying, the dying process and so on. And of course, some of the most famous soliloquies in Shakespeare are on this theme. The wonderful scene in Hamlet where they've come across um, Yorick, the sky of Yorick. If you don't know the play that well, um, what you might have missed is that in the scenes that come before this famous speech, uh, the Prince of Denmark, who's in disguise, has said to the grave digger, how long have you been digging graves? And uh, the grave digger is struck by the question and says, you know, it's an interesting question. He says this much better than I do, but of course Shakespeare wrote his words. It's an interesting question, I can tell you, precisely because I dug my first grave on the day our fair prince was born. So here's a mortality salience prime. He's, he's, he's the man in front of him, it's the prince talking in disguise, the man in front of him has been digging graves from the day he was born and there will be a grave for him. It's a, it's a beautiful piece of writing. Shakespeare knew what that might do. And then they come across the skull of Yorick. I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest. He bore me on his back a thousand times. He was the jester in the court. Uh, and and, and what, what goes on here it's, it's for Hamlet is he just doesn't understand death. He's not understanding, you know, where be, where be his jibes now, your jambles, your songs, your flashes of merriment. He's looking at this, not understanding how, how can this be real? How can the man that once carried me around be reduced to this? There was a set of wonderful stamps, you do the count yourself set of uh, stamps, a recent set of stamps for the anniversary um, of Shakespeare's birth, I think it was. Uh, so many of them are just, they just cut the last bit that's the death bit, life but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts. And Fred's is out upon the stage and they've cut the harsh reality of, uh, and then is seen no more. And of course in philosophy, the great philosophers uh, in, in many ways are drawn to this topic. Was it William James, who I believe would be more famous had he published more books rather than a, a series of lectures. Um, James says, the fact that we can die, that we can be ill at all, is what perplexes us. The fact that we now for a moment live and are well is irrelevant to that perplexity. We need a life not correlated with death, a health not liable to illness, a little loss of animal toughness, a little irritable weakness and descent of the pain threshold will bring the worm at the core of all of our usual springs of delights into full view and turn us into melancholy metaphysicians. That worm at the core notion is very relevant here. The argument is that the worm at the core of the human psyche is your knowledge of your own impermanence and it sits in the psyche 
and it nibbles away. Uh, and people deal with it in various ways. Uh, we're suggesting to you that people with psychopathology are often dealing with it in very unhelpful ways. They're going to prevent it at all costs. They're going to go to the hospital 47 times this year to emergency because they fear that maybe this is my heart. They're going to have multiple medical tests. They're going to scrub their hands until they're red raw. They're going to check every PowerPoint in the house in a circuit again and again and again. They're dealing with their dread of death in maladaptive ways, unhelpful ways. But the worm at the core, uh, James is arguing, is there in all of us. <clears throat> This is a piece from Schopenhauer. Now, I'm not, Schopenhauer was uh, an extraordinarily unwell man in my view. Uh, the more I read about him, I just wonder how many DSM-5 conditions he would, he would have met, but it would be a bunch. He was very melancholic. Every breath we draw wards off the death that constantly impinges on us. Ultimately, death must triumph, for by birth, it has already become our lot, and it plays with its prey only a short while before swallowing it up. Probably the branch of philosophy that's most relevant here, um, and, and by the way, the reason I'm covering some of this material, particularly the philosophy, is one of, the, I think, the great crimes in clinical psychology is that we ignore related but, but uh, uh, different fields. We don't tend to read in this anymore, even though most psychology departments actually evolved out of philosophy. At Sydney University, for example, the psychology department was a sub-branch of philosophy and then broke off onto its own. And yet, most of our students will never read in, in these areas. These people were not silly. They had important things to say. The existentialists tell us a lot about the, the nature of this problem. They posit a fundamental, irrational universe with no inherent purpose and that this creates what they call the existential attitude, a sense of disorientation and confusion in the face of an apparently meaningless or absurd world. Individuals have to seek to diffuse or to treat this angst. And this, the existentialists say, is best achieved by the individual finding or creating meaning. The individual has to try and find or create meaning. And meaning making and living a values based life, I'll come back to in the last uh, hour or so, 45 minutes or so of the day, uh, because we, we both, Rachel and I, both think this is probably underused in dealing with the dread of death. That the existentialists may have been onto something here that meaning making, uh, living a me try, trying to find a meaningful, uh, authentic life uh, might be one way in which we can deal with this. At first man is nothing, Sartre said, only afterwards will he be something and he himself will have made what he will be. So there's the idea laid out uh, very, very clearly. This uh, man will, will make his own meaning. He will have to find what he values. Uh, you can probably see similarities between acceptance and commitment therapy in some of this. I, I personally think it's quite striking uh, that the, the, because so much of the act is about identifying values, identifying who I wish to be. I think there are uh, interesting, interesting uh, overlaps there. I said uh, one of the problems we have is that we don't tend to read in other, other areas. And um, I was uh, thinking about death on and off over the years, noticing these similarities, but clinical psychology really lacks uh, clear theory of uh, uh, existential issues. It's just not there. And it's still lacking. Uh, theory, to, to understand theory in this area, you've got to read beyond clinical psychology. You've got to read within social psychology. And I'll ask Rachel to um, take over this section now and talk about theory uh, and how uh, theoretical propositions within social psychology 
that might explain uh, the threat of death. Okay, so as Ross has just mentioned, there has been this absence of theory within clinical psychology. Is that better? Yeah. yeah okay. So within social psychology, however, over the last few decades, there's been quite a prominent theory. So in 1973, Ernest Becker published his Pulitzer Prize winning work, The Denial of Death. And in this, he argued that humans have an innate motivation to live, but that it's coupled with a knowledge that our death is ultimately inevitable, and that this coupling can produce a very crippling fear. So emerging from Becker's ideas um, about a decade later came the field of terror management theory. And terror management theory argues that humans have two main buffers against death anxiety. The first of these buffers are cultural worldviews, and cultural worldviews are essentially shared symbolic concepts of reality or concepts of the world. And these cultural worldviews give us a sense of permanence and meaning in our life, and we can gain a sense of virtual immortality by buying into various <coughs> beliefs of our culture. So cultural worldviews could include things like um, worldviews focusing on academic success, achieving a sense of meaning and purpose in your life in this way. Could also be um, a worldview about financial success or cultural worldviews focusing on things like um, consumerism, materialism. Could be cultural worldviews focusing on sporting achievements um, or fame. So perhaps it's <coughs> surprising that in Australia we refer to some of our um, highest, most successful uh, athletes as the immortals, um, perhaps not a coincidence. And it could also be cultural worldviews, uh, religious worldviews, such as a belief in a religious afterlife. So by buying into any or multiple different cultural worldviews, we have a sense that we're living on through something greater than ourself. And the second buffer that they propose is self-esteem, in that by fulfilling various expectations of these different cultural worldviews, we gain a sense of meaning in our life. So if a cultural worldview might be academic success, we gain self-esteem by um, winning a grant or getting another publication, um, or getting a promotion in our workplace. A second crucial aspect of terror management theory is this idea of the dual process model which suggests that the effects of death anxiety differ depending on how conscious these thoughts of death are. So when these thoughts of death are conscious, um, we might have just, just seen um, an ad for a funeral parlor on TV. When these thoughts of death are conscious, we engage in proximal defense mechanisms. So we suppress these thoughts of death, um, we try and distract ourselves from them, or we deny our vulnerability. So we might tell ourselves, that we eat a very healthy diet, that we're quite young, um, we're unlikely to die from the illness that we've just heard about. When these thoughts of death become um, unconscious, this is when we engage in distal defense mechanisms. So this is when we kind of try and strengthen those two buffers. So we try and bolster our self-esteem uh, and defend our own cultural worldviews, which give us that crucial sense of meaning and permanence. So, from a terror management perspective, um, the dread of death may account for large parts of human behaviour. And there have been over 200 mortality salient studies run um, in which death primes are given to participants, typically in the lab. Um, these death primes can be done in various ways. The most common method is asking participants to answer to um, questions, asking them to reflect on their own death and their emotions about that. Um, but other methods of priming have been used, such as conducting the experiments near funeral homes or cemeteries, and also just asking people to look at depictions of death. And using these, this variety of different methods across these 200 or more studies, they've shown that these death fears can have a really broad impact on a range of sort of normal human behaviours. So an early terror management study looked at um, aggression, um, in this study by Lieberman and colleagues, they had um, American participants who were randomly allocated to receive the mortality salience or death prime or a control condition. And then all the participants were given an essay to read, 
Um, the essay was either consistent with their cultural worldviews, so it was a nationalistic essay, a pro-America essay, um, or it threatened or challenged their worldview, so it was an anti-nationalistic, anti-US essay. And then after this, participants were told that they would have the opportunity to allocate a certain amount of very hot chili sauce to the writer of this essay, the apparent writer of this essay. And they were told that the writer of the essay really didn't like spicy foods, they really wouldn't want to eat this chili sauce, but they would be forced to consume whatever amount was allocated to them. Um, and this was used as a measure of aggression. So they found that participants who had been primed with death allocated twice as much hot sauce if they believed they were serving it to someone with another cultural worldview. So when participants thought that they were allocating this hot sauce to someone who was um, anti-nationalistic, anti-America, um, they were twice as aggressive using this kind of methodology. And this has been used to explain um, things like racism or aggression towards people with different religious or cultural worldviews. So it's been shown to impact aggression clearly, um, but it's been shown to impact a, a number of different normal human behaviours, such as um, driving materialism and consumerism, um, and also leading people to prescribe harsher punishments for moral transgressors. But what about abnormal behaviour? Um, and the answer is that we, we simply don't know. There's been a real scarcity of research looking at mortality salience designs in the area of abnormal or clinically relevant behaviours. So as we've sort of already touched on, um, we argue that death anxiety is a transdiagnostic construct and that it may relate to the revolving door of mental health that we often see in clinical practice. Um, so it's not uncommon for someone to present um, with a long history of different diagnoses. So a patient might have had separation anxiety disorder in childhood, they may have received treatment for this, um, treatment that looked effective for that particular disorder. Um, but then as an adolescent, they may present with something that looks on the surface quite different, such as panic disorder. Um, again, this could be treated, um, but then as an adult, they might come to our clinic with something again that looks fundamentally different, like OCD. And the question is, are these different diagnoses and disorders truly independent, um, discrete events, or are they not? Is there some kind of thread that's underlying these different um, disorders in an individual's life? And we would argue that it's the dread of death that's the sort of common theme among these. So this death anxiety may underpin a range of disorders, um, as we've already touched on. Um, panic disorder, separation anxiety disorder with those themes of harm upon separation, um, specific phobias, so the most common subtypes of phobias, heights, snakes, spiders, in the verbal reports. Um, these are clearly quite directly linked to fears of death. Um, PTSD often explicitly involves the threat of death due to often confrontation with that death or um, risk of serious harm. And in OCD, which is um, something I'll touch on a bit more today, again, if we look at the most common subtypes, there's a clear, a clear link with this fear of death. So um, in contamination concerns, people will wash their hands to the point where they're almost bleeding because they're worried about contracting HIV from shaking someone's hand, for example. Um, again, in checking, there's that concern that the house could burn down if I don't continually check the stove through the night. Uh, and in the aggressive obsessions, of course, there's the idea that even my thoughts can kill. If I have the thought or image that I'm going to stab my child, that means there's a risk I might actually do that. So, despite these apparent connections, at least based on um, verbal reports of what patients appear to be saying to us, there's been no study investigating the fear of death's relationship to complex mental health severity in a clinical population. So I wanted to know whether death anxiety might account for the severity and lifetime number of mental health diagnoses. Um, and this led me to um, conduct some research which was just published in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology um, earlier this year with Ilan Dunimrod. So in our first study, we expected that within our sample of OCD participants, um, we would find positive correlations between fear of death and OCD severity, both um, self-report measures of this and the clinician's rating of this, um, and also relationships between fear of death and various different lifetime markers of psychopathology. So things like the number of diagnoses an individual has across the lifespan, a clinician's judgment of that person's overall distress or impairment, 
the number of hospitalizations they've had for mental health reasons, as well as the number of medications that they're on. So we had 171 participants, all of whom had been diagnosed with OCD, uh, mean age of 34 years, average OCD duration of 13 years, and an average total lifetime diagnosis of um, three. So again, it's, it doesn't seem like it's the case that on average people are presenting with just one diagnosis in their history. It appears that um, on average when people are presenting, they have a more complex history than what we're just seeing in the room in terms of diagnoses. So we administered a range of measures, um, the Anxiety and Related Disorders Interview Schedule, or ADIS, um, also the Vancouver Obsessive Compulsive Inventory, or VOCI, and the Collett Lester Fear of Death Scale, which is one of the more um, common fear of death measures used. To give you an idea of what that particular scale looks like, um, it has four different subscales. The first is fear of death of the self, um, with items such as the total isolation of death frightens me. Also death of others, um, so I would never get over the death of someone close to me. Then there are the two dying subscales, which focus more on the actual process of dying. So I'm disturbed by the physical degeneration involved in a slow death. And the dying of others, such as I would avoid a friend who was dying. So what did we find? In terms of OCD severity, across those four different subscales of fear of death, all four subscales um, had significant and positive correlations with both measures of OCD severity. So the self-report measure of the VOCI, but also the clinician's rating of that person's severity on the ADIS. And if we average those out, it comes down to about 0.45. So it seems like at least among the correlational data, there does appear to be this significant relationship between fears of death and um, OCD severity at least. But is this something that's purely restricted to OCD? Um, or is there a link between fears of death and people's broader psychopathology? So when we look at the markers of broader mental health, we can see that again, across those four subscales of the fear of death measure, there are significant and positive correlations with the total number of diagnoses an individual has, has had across their lifetime, their distress and impairment, the number of hospitalizations they've had, and the total number of medications. Um, and these average out to about 0.41. So it's starting to look like this isn't something purely restricted to OCD. Uh, it's starting to look like that your own, um, one's own fears of your own impermanence and mortality seem to be associated with your overall mental health um, impairment, as well as the number of different disorders you're likely to suffer across your lifespan. So we did find these significant relationships, um, and I think importantly, these relationships still remained significant after we controlled for neuroticism. So it seems like death anxiety may mediate OCD severity and these lifetime markers of psychopathology in this group, but of course, um, it is a correlational design which can't establish causality, which is um, a limitation of various different studies in this sort of area but it's at least consistent with the idea that death priming causes abnormal behavior. Um, but of course we needed experimental research in order to establish causality. So in terms of what already existed in this area, there was only one experimental study that looked at OCD relevant behavior from a terror management perspective. It was done by Strawn and colleagues, and they looked at students who scored high or low on a measure of hand washing. Um, they allocated them to a mortality salience or control prime, and they then asked them to um, wash their hands, and they measured washing duration, soap use, and paper towel use. So they found a main effect for washer groups, the higher hand washes washed more, but also a main effect for salience condition. So those primed with death also wash significantly more than the control, as well as an interaction. And they found trends, but no main effects for paper towel or soap use. So this was the only study that really existed in this, in this topic, um, but it had several limitations. Um, the first of which was it used a student sample, so no one in the study had been diagnosed with OCD and they were by no means um, a treatment-seeking sample. Um, they also liked an equally anxious control group, so by having the no-anxiety group, um, by having the, the low hand washing group, sorry, it's essentially the same as having a, a no anxiety group. So it's difficult to tell whether it was something that was related to the level of anxiety or specifically the actual um, severity of the hand washing. 
And the study also just appears to be underpowered, which could explain their failure to find paper towel or soap effects. So in my second study, I really wanted to extend the work of Strawn. Um, it was the first attempt at a mortality salient study within OCD or within any treatment-seeking clinical sample. Um, and as Ross has already mentioned, I think that's probably because clinical psychology in general isn't really being informed of the work in social psychology um, and vice versa as well. I think this explains the, the gap in this literature. So I wanted to know whether thoughts of death increase washing behaviours among participants diagnosed with OCD. So I expected there would be a main effect for OCD subtypes, so unsurprisingly we would expect the washers to wash more than the non-washers. Um, I also expected a main effect for prime type, such that those primed with death should wash more than the control condition. Uh, we also expected an interaction, such that the effect of the mortality salience prime would be more pronounced for the washers than for the non-washers. And given the role of self-esteem as a buffer in terror management theory, uh, we also expected that self-esteem would moderate the mortality salience effect. So we administered a range of measures again, um, the ATIS again, the Vancouver Obsessive Compulsive Inventory again, um, the Rosenberg Self-Esteem Scale, the Collett Lester Fear of Death Scale, um, and also the Positive and Negative Affect Scales, or PANAS, um, which measure different, um, different emotions, but also broadly positive and negative affect, to check that there were no mood differences between the groups after the prime. So we needed 132 participants to have 80% power to detect a medium effect. Um, so we needed 66 OCD washers and 66 OCD non-washers. We used a two-fold decision rule to establish these groups, so both the self-report and clinician rating. So to be classed as a washer, you needed a Voggy contamination scale score of 14 or more. Um, and on the clinician administered ATIS, you needed a current washing score of six or more. To be classed as a non-washer, you needed a Voggy contamination scale score of 11 or less, and on the ADIS current washing, a 2 or less. So we wanted to really make sure we have two very clear-cut groups of um, washers and non-washers. And importantly, the groups didn't differ on any other measure. So we can see that the washers and non-washers significantly differ um, on the Voggy washing score and the ADIS current washing score, um, as we would hope if we'd done our job correctly. But importantly, they don't differ on anything else. So we have two groups of OCD participants who are um, equally as distressed, equally as fearful of death. Um, their OCD is equally as severe. They just differ in the extent to which they wash. So we randomly allocated them to a mortality salience or dental pain, um, dental pain prime. Um, the dental pain prime is the standard control prime used in mortality salience research. Um, because it's considered to be aversive, but not explicitly related or directly related to death. Um, and this allocation was all double-blinded. Participants were given a packet of questionnaires, including the PRIME, um, a filler task, and the PANAS, the measure of mood. And the PRIME was the standard PRIME used in uh, mortality salience research, which was, please briefly describe the emotions that the thought of your own death arouses in you, and jot down as specifically as you can what do you think will happen to you as you physically die and once you're physically dead? And the dental pain prime is essentially identical wording, but just replacing the word death with the words dental pain. So participants were told we were looking at galvanic skin response on a performance task. Um, and this was quite a convincing cover story. I think we had the galvanic skin response feedback displayed live on an iPad in front of them. And they were told that this is why we were putting um, gel and electrodes on two fingers of their non-dominant hand. Um, but of course, the real reason we were doing this was to uh, give us an opportunity to ask them to wash their hands following this task, which is what we were really interested in. They then had five minutes to complete a word search task, um, which was included primarily um, because that, that time delay has been shown to be really important in terror management research, to allow those thoughts of death um, to become less conscious. They were then asked to wash, and this was audio recorded for accuracy, and we recorded the time they spent washing, um, the soap use, used, so we weighed a soap container pre and post task, and also the number of paper towel squares that they used. Finally, after that, we asked them two further questions, um, which was how comfortable did they feel being connected to the machine, and how clean did they find the experimental area to be. Um, and again, this was included just to reduce the chance of, of any confounds. 
So in terms of the results for all three behavioural cleaning measures, um, we found a significant main effect for OCD subtypes, the washers were washing more, um, but also more importantly, the significant main effect for salience condition. So you can see if we look at the washing duration, the washers on the, on the left are washing significantly more on average than the non-washers on the right, um, but more interestingly, we can see that those in the death condition are washing significantly more than those in the control. So for a washer who's allocated to the death prime, they're averaging a washing duration of around 21 seconds compared to a washer in the dental pain who's averaging a nine second hand wash. And if we look at soap usage, um, again, we see the same sort of pattern of results. And again, if we look at paper towel usage also. We also found a significant interaction for washing duration and soap. Um, so as you can probably tell from the graph, the effect was, um, the effect of the mortality salience prime was pronounced for the washers, um, but not a significant interaction for paper towels once we um, conservatively removed two outliers. So further analysis revealed that there was no difference between the washers and the non-washers in the absence of this mortality salience prime. So it seemed like the gel wasn't threatening because in the control condition, the washers and the non-washers were cleaning in a non-significantly different fashion. And mortality salience was leading the washers to wash, but it wasn't having an effect on the non-washers. I think it's also important to note the clinical significance of this effect above and beyond the statistical significance. So if you think about how long a 21 second hand wash actually lasts for, um, it's a very lengthy hand wash. It's around three times the community, community standard hand wash. Um, and it's also not a small effect given it was really just a simple gel that had been applied to their fingers, less than a, a five cent piece probably. Um, it wasn't a substance that should have been viewed as particularly contaminating or threatening. Uh, and yet we were still seeing these very lengthy hand washes when people are asked to think about death. Uh, in terms of the PANAS, there were no differences in mood um, as a result of the death primal control. Uh, and this is consistent with terror management research. So people don't report feeling more um, anxious or more sad um, after the death prime. And there were also no differences in either the cleanliness or the comfort ratings um, between any of the groups. So again, it doesn't seem like this gel is producing discomfort or contamination concerns. It seems like something else is going on here. Uh, and the mortality salience didn't appear to increase conscious discomfort or perceptions of cleanliness. Um, so it appears that there wasn't an increased expectancy of harm um, as we would often expect to see in these sorts of, um, with these sorts of behaviors.